Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and we are live with the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to episode 102. Uh, my guest today is Seth Resnick, and we're going to talk about exciting photo destinations. He has been on every continent this year, so stay tuned. First, just let me remind you that we are live on Facebook at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Fridays. So it's facebook.com slash understand photography and sometimes you have to scroll down to find the feed. And then on Saturday, it goes on to YouTube and as a podcast. So just do a search under the Understand Photography Show and you'll find us. And please subscribe while you're there. It really helps. Even a review would be even better. Thanks. We have a uh, few photo tours scheduled for this season. Um, I'm leading two ladies only photo tours. The first one is in December, December 5th through the 7th to Mount Dora, Florida. And if you've never been there, it is the cutest little town. Actually, do a Google search for it, but not right now. Pay attention. Anyway, it's, it's like got all the Victorian homes and a cute little downtown and it's on a chain of lakes. So we rent a boat. It's, it's fun and it'll, all the Christmas lights will be up. So that's December 5th through the 7th. And then um, February 2nd through 9th, we're doing a ladies only Cuba tour to Havana. You have to go to Havana and also Vinales, um, which is where the tobacco farms are and it's harvesting time. So it's going to be a really, really fun tour. So we have all the information on our website, understandphotography.com. Joe Fitzpatrick is also leading his tours. He's going to the Everglades which isn't far for us, but usually the guests come from, from a distance. Everglades, St. Augustine, Florida, and then Florida's Forgotten Coast, which is in the Panhandle, and it's like old Florida. It's just, it's just amazing. It's so beautiful up there. Our online classes are still on sale. We've, we're having a summer sale. All of our classes are on sale through August 31st. And if you're considering the four weeks to proficiency in photography, so if you're a beginner or you have any gaps in your photo ed education, that's a really good, um, that's a good course to give you a foundation or to fill in some gaps. Anyway, that starts September 9th, but it's only on sale through August 31st. So if you're thinking about taking that class, sign up now. Um, and we're working on some new classes, so stay tuned for that. So my guest today is Seth Resnick. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> we're on take two. Take two. <laughs> now you're, uh, now you're, uh, it says you're a master photographer. What does that mean? Uh, I guess that's a name that someone gave me. Somebody gave you? <laughs> I've been a photographer for a very long time. Now tell so me. So that makes a, me master. Give us your, your overview. Um, tell us about My Seth overview. Resnick. I wear a bunch of different hats. Um, I'm Seth Resnick, photographer. I started out as a photojournalist, um, went to Syracuse and graduated in 1979, did a lot of work for the New York Times, worked on a story that got nominated for a Pulitzer, ended up at the Olympics, wow. met some folks from Sports Illustrated, and then started doing a bunch of magazine work. I left the newspaper, um, been published in about 2,500 magazines worldwide. Oh my gosh. Um, from there, I started doing um, annual reports, worked on like Ben & Jerry's annual report and the Dial Corporation and Apple's uh, annual report, and then advertising. And each time I eventually got bored because you're sort of doing somebody else's idea. And yeah. I decided really that I want to do my ideas. Yeah. So um, I started doing workshops and going on location where I could really pursue my own interests. Now, how long have you been doing workshops? Um, my first workshop uh, was actually one that my now wife hired me for, ah. and, and that was 2002. So you can you can do them. Ah, that it goes back a while. That sounds like a good story. Um, so that's one hat. Ah, then I okay. then I have um, another hat, which is um, D65. D65 is a company that I run with my wife Jamie Spritzer, and um, we teach uh, digital workflow. We taught Photoshop workflow and bridge workflow and now we teach lightroom workflow and I'm on the um, uh, an advisory board if you will for Adobe um, wow. when developing lightroom and Photoshop and um, then I have another company called digital photo <laughs> destinations that is with John Paul Caponegro and we run um, sort of exotic uh, travel workshops and their workshops not photo tours which we'll get to and talk about okay. and those run around the world um, Wow. And then I do a bunch of consulting, and I work with X-Rite and NEC and Red River Paper and Ilford, 
um, Nikon. Oh my gosh. So in between sleep, I yeah, I, I don't even know. Down. Okay, so tell me about your Lightroom classes. How do you so teach Lightroom classes? Are they local? Um, or are they on the we internet? Teach, we used to travel around the country, um, but I like to keep them small and the travel expenses and all just got to be too much. So we actually run them out of our home yeah. in um, uh, in Palm Beach Gardens. Um, we limit it to eight people. Uh, we run them whenever I'm around. So it's it's. The, the the next, there's one com them. actually one coming up in a few weeks, um, and it is a true workshop. It, it's both my wife and I teach eight students. We also pair it with a extraordinary dinner and a wine tasting. Ooh, fun! Um, and we have a, so a couple of night sessions where we get into creativity because um, Lightroom, Photoshop, they're all hammers. Mm -hmm. And you know you can buy the most expensive hammer in the world, and you can still bend a nail and still hurt your finger. You can buy a really cheap hammer and, and do it right, but the real key is that they're just tools. Yeah. The rest of it is really what's what's in here. So while we teach later when we teach workflow, it's useless without without a, without a goal and a and a concept of what you're really trying to accomplish. So we have to work that in, and that usually does pretty well with the wine. Ah, but you don't go out and take pictures. They bring. We actually on. during that workshop, we actually um, they shoot every day, but we're not actually. We don't really care so much about about the images as much as as the workflow. When we do our is it just one workshops, day or is it? No, it's four days. Oh, it's four, four very days. long days. Wow. Tears and smiles. But boy, I bet you get you come out. But you come a out really Photoshop. learning. You do Photoshop like, and do, Lightroom we together. We do Photoshop and Lightroom, but really it's concentrating on Lightroom and image management and, and then processing. For the processing part, we get into Lightroom and Photoshop. Wow, that sounds awesome. Because I, I find, I've been using Lightroom you know, seven years maybe, and I, I still struggle with it. <laughs> Joe is really good at Lightroom, thank God, because you know, we needed a Lightroom expert in this area, and thank God Joe can do something, because it's hard for me. Well, we like, have a couple openings in our, in our one coming up. When is it? I don't know. I'd have yeah, to look I don't the know. <laughs> What's your website? We'll start well, there. Well, you can start with SethResnick.com. Okay. All right. Now, um, so that's your Lightroom. Now, the workshops. And then the, the travel workshops are through the organization is Digital Photo Destinations. You can also find it on SethResnick.com or D65.com or DigitalPhotoDestinations.com or JohnPaulCaprinegro.com. Oh, my goodness. We're pretty easy to, to, <laughs> to track down. Let's just do um, Seth Resnick. <laughs> I have multiple workshops because I'm bipolar. Shit, this year, I'm officially bipolar because I'll be on both poles in the same oh year. Oh, Having been in Antarctica in um, February this year and after this, end of September, middle of September, I head to um, the North Pole wow. in Greenland. Wow. So, yes. You've been on every continent this year? Or that will in, be? In the past 12 months, I've been on every months. continent. Oh, um, my gosh. And, but but the, the months never sort of end. Cause they, so when I say every year, it's every year. But, but it's You're when you start on, the year. Yeah. I mean, most people start in January. But, you know, I, my if, year, if I look I at the last 12 months, I've been on every continent. Yeah. Wow. So, all right. So how many do you do in a year? That's a very good question. It, it depends. Um, it sounds like typically, a lot. No, um, typically four, four or five travel workshops. We also do some creativity workshops. We also do those late room workshops. Also do a lot of guest speaking. So I, I, I but go. But the travel a lot. workshops are only four or five a year. Four or five big ones a year. Okay, so that's not as. I thought you were going like every month. Well, I was going to say, oh, my God. No, I, I, I need to sleep every now and then. Once in a while, yes. for crying out loud. <laughs> but they're, you know, they're, they're big trips. It's like Antarctica, Greenland, Japan, Wow. And um, are New they Zealand. like two weeks or? So, um, they they depend anywhere from, anywhere from a week to, to more than two weeks. Okay. Yeah, because one of my customers went on one of, that's how I found oh, okay. you, went on one of your tours, George. <laughs> George Frank. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so hey, what? George went to Africa with me. Oh, did he? Is it? I didn't. I didn't remember where he went. I just knew that he really, really enjoyed well, it. He went to Africa. Actually, actually, George went to Africa, and we also went to photograph the volcano when it was erupting. Oh, in you're Iceland. the one who flew. I'm with the them? one who we flew. Yeah. He told me that story. Yeah, it was quite a. Yeah, we went up to the. We had the luck was totally on our side. We we flew. We landed in. Ditched a plane in a hangar and 
it was clouded in and it was fogged in and we were told the fog wasn't going to break and we one night it just opened up and the whole thing was erupting in front of us and it was fantastic oh my god that sounds crazy to me but <laughs> it was awesome oh my gosh okay so what is the difference between a photo tour and a photo workshop. So, excellent question. Um, is, this, is this, are you going to give me your opinion or is this No, I'm going to give fact? you, a, the, the, I'm going to give you my opinion and a fact. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'll tell you what we don't do. Mm -hmm. We don't take you to a location and say, this is the great tree in Africa and we can do a nighttime picture. And if you set your cameras up here on a tripod and you, you do it at this exposure for this amount of time, you'll get this great picture. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's, absolute what we don't do. We want people to find what their own vision is. We're going to talk about the difference between vision and style mm -hmm. and find their vision in a location. Okay. So we bring you to a location but we ask you ahead of time to put into words what you're looking for, why you're, why you're going there. You mean before you even get before there? Before you even get there you gotta do some what research. What if you don't know what it looks like? It's not always just about what it looks like, it's about what's inside of you. Okay. And that's, that's where the vision statement comes in, which okay. is different from style. Um, so for me, for example, um, having been to Antarctica, my favorite place in the world is truly Antarctica, and this will be my wow. 11th trip to the continent it's this year. you're from New York and you can take the cold. Yeah, right. But my <laughs> other favorite place is Namibia. Which is hot. Um, in, 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 in the desert. And it was very interesting to actually have a bipolar conversation with myself <laughs> and um, ask, you know, um, so why do you love both? And it's very interesting because to have that conversation and what it came down to is I'm chasing wave patterns. And once I was able to figure that out, I have wave pat patterns in the ice and then oh, I have those wave patterns in the sand, sand dunes and then I can ask myself, where else do I find those wave patterns? So I can find those wave patterns in certain rocks. I can find those wave patterns maybe inside trees. Um, started making a lot of sense to me. I was a competitive skier. I, oh. when I talk with my hands, you'll see I do this. I make S turns all the time. Oh my God. My business partner, JP, talks like this all the time. He's all about big wide open landscapes. I talk like this. I'm about compacted space and S turns. And so there's a lot you find. I mean, and one of the things that happens in a workshop, different than a photo tour, is you really find, you really start to discover yourself okay. in, in a whole lot more ways than just, I'm taking a picture. Okay, so, all right, so you're about to take me, let's say, because I, I don't have a desire to go anywhere cold ever. My son, who, you know, his, he and his wife were raised here in Florida, and they went on their honeymoon to Iceland. I don't like that idea. I went up north this summer, but I don't want to go up there in the winter. So let's say I go to Namibia with you. <laughs> so so we're about to go to our first location. Where's that? Um, well, it depend probably in South Sicily, which are the largest sand dunes in the world. Okay, so we're going to these sand dunes. Can and you the say South Sicily? I don't think so. That's why I didn't <laughs> say it. <laughs> That's why I didn't attempt. <laughs> At least I didn't ask you to pronounce the, the uh, volcano in Iceland. I so know. You know. Oh, oh, I'm going to <laughs> Prague next year, and I'm. I'm reading and I'm like, I can't pronounce there anything go. there. But anyway, okay, so it's the day before, right? And you're going to say to me, actually, what's your vision for the shoot? Actually, it's going to be before a day before. It's going to be, oh. we're going to write to you several times and we're going to ask you what... Oh, this is before I even get on the Before you even, right when you're interested. Ah. So what are you interested in? And, so and how are so you going to draw that say out things, of me? So people say things like, well, I really like flowers. And I'll say, why? Uh, well, my mom liked flowers. Why? And the more you keep asking why, eventually you start getting to the root of some of this stuff, no pun intended. Um, I can't think of what And I then you start tying those things together. And for me, that's the way I tied, you know, it's easy to say I love the beauty of Antarctica, I love the beauty of Africa. But, you know, really getting to why and what's similar, um, I'm really intrigued with sensuality in nature. Uh -huh. um, uh, in a very large picture, I want people to look at my pictures and have a better respect for the environment. Okay. Um, so that would be sort of my mission statement, and that, that goes along with what my vision statement is. My style is very bold color, compacted space, um, a very filled frame. 
there's a difference between style and vision. We want to draw out what your vision is and then what's your style going to be. And if we talk about painting for a minute, you walk in, you look at a Van Gogh. You actually don't have to look at the signature. Yeah. Some of his work you do, but right. a lot of the work you glean, you know it's a Van Gogh. You look at um, glass by Chihuly. You mm -hmm. can tell a mile away that's a Chihuly glass. Well, that's because he has a, they both had a vision. They also both had a very clear style. Okay. A lot of photographers lack both of those. Yes. They say, I photograph butterflies. Right. Or the one I like the most is people go, I photograph wildlife. And I always say, hmm, have you seen the work of... Um, Franz Lanting or Art Wolf. Yeah, I love that. I go, so they would tell you they don't photograph wildlife, yet they're really well-known wildlife photographers. They're each chasing something beyond wildlife. What, what are they, you chasing? What would they say they I did? would let them tell you what they're, what they're chasing. Um, Art Wolf is really fascinating with patterns in, in oh. nature, and um, Franz Lanting is, is a storyteller. is really going beyond just, it's, it's not maybe, it's not about a, a tiger chasing something is maybe it is about about going after the prey or whatever whatever the uh -uh. His, so we want people to really find what their story is okay and then how you're going to photograph that story and that's a starting point so it's work and then each day we do reviews of the images and we talk about a lot of technical stuff um, so um, like when we go to Antarctica we might go out in a zodiac three times in a day and then in your free time, we have two or three lectures. Wow. And you're exhausted. And yeah. you're, you're totally mentally drained and totally feel enriched. And it's, it's really a fantastic experience, but very different than a photo tour. Right. So the neat part is 80% of our folks have done more than two or three workshops with us. That's more than two or three. Wow, two or three. that's awesome. Um, well, especially if you only do five a year. Yeah, and well, and they're, you know, a lot of these are not inexpensive, so. Yeah, um, yeah. A great deal of respect for, but people really find that, that they grow photographically and they grow their vision. And that's, for me, that's an important part. And that's the hard part for me to, to get, you know ah. what I mean? Like Why? when you say, what's your vision? Because I, I understand the style. So what do you like to photograph? So well, you can play this game right now. Yeah, right? oh geez. <laughs> I put myself on the spot, didn't I? <laughs> This is hard You're for me, You're supposed to be asking the questions. Is, I know, but I, you know. This is hard so for me, and I bet it's hard for a lot of people. It is hard, because people don't actually... Because I don't think about... I think about... Like, because I like to photograph pretty much everything. And I struggle to have, you know, my own style and collection. So I know when I'm selling my artwork what sells. Like, my infrared collections sell. My, I do landscapes infrared, and that sells. And I like doing it, but I also like photographing babies and models and uh, macro and you know what I mean I've got so that you need to look for what the continuity is between those yeah. and if you were to put together a portfolio what is the continuity that binds that portfolio together yeah I don't know my stuff looks all over the place to me that's why I force myself and, to do collections because and, I and force a lot, myself a lot to of photographers do but if we go to look at any of the if we, if we look at any of the master painters mm -hmm. Rembrandt, Rembrandt, Renoir, you go on and on. They all have, a, a, you know, their work had a very distinct, or still does for the ones that are living, a distinct vision and a very distinct style. Glass blowers. Um, See, people I get the ceramics. style, the vision part I'm struggling with. <laughs> um, I, get, I get that because I know that's, you know, I know you have to have like Clyde Butcher, black and white landscapes of the Everglades, you know, even if when he doesn't do the Everglades, he does black and white, large format, blah, blah, blah. You know, that, of course, he's our famous guy down here, of course, but, you know, you can see that style. I'm trying to think other photographers. But he's also about preservation of the, of the land. This is true. So but his, did, did his he start vision, that way? I don't think so. He started, I think, in the back of a trailer he doing started, like postcard stuff. Well, he started as an architect. But if you were to, I believe if you were to ask him about what his goal is for his photographs now, now, especially the ones that he feels. So is the vision like your goal? The vision is what drives you photographically. The vision, and okay, what you're there. Trying to communicate. All right, good. I'm starting to get it. So the vision is what drives you photographically. Hmm. Does your photograph have to have a purpose? Um, I think everything has to have a purpose. <laughs> 
because isn't I, sometimes I think we don't I normally I, I, I think that we <laughs> sh- but but what's fun to you wouldn't be fun to someone else this is true so if you go deeper why why do you have fun doing it you're going to hit on things that that are inspiring about photography that you don't find doing that's, something else that's a good point and, and once you can track that it's a real like aha moment like wow um so if I, I were going to Namibia, I would say, I'm not interested in taking pictures of little tiny things. I want big landscapes. I know that about and, myself. And I would say, and why? And, and again, exploring those whole answers of why. I start, <laughs> and and you, we actually make you write a mission statement. Oh, my um, gosh. And it changes constantly. I change mine regularly. One of my biggest, biggest aha moments was my original mission statement said, because I started out as a journalist, um, uh, and a lot of my photographs of people were, were up close. I started out saying I like to break personal space, and I said that because as soon as you go, as soon as you go into somebody like that, there's a moment where where they react differently. When you get and too close, just for our audio listeners. <laughs> yes, because if you can't see that, then I, I get yeah. that. But I was literally in um, South America photographing a rock, and I started laughing because I'm like. This guy doesn't have a lot of personal space. I mean, and I changed the word from breaking personal space to entering personal space. And then it evolved into entering the energy between myself and the subject. Okay. And I know that sounds really like way out there, but the reason my photograph of a rock looks good and someone standing next to me looks like it's just a photograph of a rock is I found something more than just a rock. Uh-huh. And that is, became uh, the start of what my mission statement was. And then it's like, and, and what do you want to do with this rock? Well, I want to, you know, I want to save the world. Well, okay, how, you know, we all want to save the world. What's the idea of your images? Well, I really would like people to understand that in these really remote places, that this earth is really fragile, it's changing, and we need to preserve it. Okay. Now suddenly you start stringing those words together and you have a mission statement. And one of the easiest ways to build a mission statement is, and it's an exercise we actually do in every workshop, is write down 25 keywords of what your images are about. Ah. And write down 25 keywords about what your personality is about. Now just sort of link those keywords together. And when I edit, when I actually go through images, one of, one of the things I look at is how many of my keywords are in these images. And it's not that I will only use those. Right, right. But, and there's times when I go, ah, I have a new keyword. And there's times where I go, okay, this is an interesting image, but it really doesn't fit my body of work that I'm working on because most of these keywords are, are missing. But it's, it, and then you tie those keywords together and all of a sudden you have a mission statement. Okay. It's That's, work. That is work. So are the people who take your tours, are they, Photo art. I'm sorry. Oh, I just did that. <laughs> oh, I can't believe I just did that. Anyway, the people who go on your workshops, are they very, like, real serious about they want to sell their artwork? Is that why they go they don't with you? Necessarily. We have some people that, want that are, we have, we have professional photographers. We have very serious hobbyists. Mm-hmm. We have people that start out. We have, we have a, a lady who's basically started out accompanying her husband who made it a point of saying, I'm not a photographer. In fact, we've had several of those who, they're definitely not photographers. They're just here to take pictures. But then they start listening to the lectures and they find things that they dial into and all of a sudden, you know, bingo, they're, they're really a photographer. And they really have specific things that they're tracking and photographing. Ah, um, so you bring the photographer out in them. Yeah, you know, it's sort of like laying on the couch and telling you about what drives you. And we do it with a camera. So now when you actually are on the photo tour workshops, <laughs> why am I doing that? What, what do you do there to help we'll, we'll make do, that vision we'll, or whatever? We'll do reviews each day. Okay. Um, we may start out with having someone write down their 25 keywords. Then when they show their images, mm. they read the keywords and the other people in the workshops. And we don't, our workshops have, uh, like Antarctic will take 18 people. We do okay. some of the other ones will take as few as eight. So it's, 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 we're not talking about hundreds of people. Right. Um, but like the, everyone will go, are these keywords in those images? Are there keywords you guys can think of 
that we relate see. better to these images. Ah. That's we do like a little brainstorming. We, with so the group. we do a lot of brainstorming, and then we okay. do a lot of brainstorming on how what what's going to tie these images together. Um, as someone who's looked at a lot of portfolios over the year, it always bothered me that anyone who graduated a photo school or even s someone who didn't, you can put together 10 good pictures. Yep. I mean, it's very easy. Yes. Okay. And what does that tell me about you? Well, I look at a picture of a, a wedding portrait and a rhinoceros and a flower and a sunset. Uh, I'm confused. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd rather look at a body of work. Right that really starts to tell me more about what that person's interested in. And we, we encourage people to at least start on a body of work. One of the reasons I go back to locations is because you can't always finish a body of work in, in one trip. Okay. So um, it'll be my 11th trip to Antarctica and I will wow. probably continue going every year because that body of work is still has a, has a lot more. Now what do you, do you sell your work? I um, I have a long list of clientele who buy prints, and okay. I do a lot of gallery shows. Um, so yes. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> and, and then there's there's stock that goes through agencies, and, and I I stopped doing assignment work because it ended up being I still do some magazine I do a fair amount of magazine work still, but but it's from work that I'm generating. Okay, so you you take the pictures, and if they I, want it. Yes, correct. Okay. So you're still your own man. Still my own, yes. <laughs> so now how do you decide where to go? Okay, you said you go to Antarctica because um, you love I've it. Got a, I've Namibia, got a running bucket it. list. Okay. Um, um, so certain locations we will go to very regularly. Antarctica and Greenland in part because of climate change and, and being able to see both those places each year and see the, the differences. Um, really educational and, and, I mean, scary and all of that at the same time. Um, and I want to just, and, and also I'm, I'm working on a body on sensuality and nature. Uh -huh. And both those, loca those locations tend to really offer me uh, visions that, that fit that a lot. Uh -huh. um, there's a whole bucket. I mean, as, although I've been on every continent, there there are a million places that I still want to go that I haven't, haven't been. been yet. Um, there's a there's a lake in Russia, that's a freshwater lake that the water's blue and there's icebergs and so it's really cold. It's in Siberia. Ah. It's 100 <laughs> degrees below zero. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> there's Ethiopia where it, it's, there happens to be deadly gases around it, but the the water and the and the ground is yellow and like fluorescent yellow and red. It's it's, it's incredible. Um, uh, the painted mountains in China, um, Cambodia. So these are um, all on your bu on your bucket list. My you bucket haven't list, been here yet. My bucket list is is, oh my is like this long. Um, so what will be okay? So you, uh, obviously you've got your tours planned out for the next year or so. Um, we always There's have workshops. things. In, we always have things in the in the making. Um, we're very lucky that our workshops sell out very quick so okay. for example um, we are selling Antarctica now Antarctica 2020 and oh, it is okay. half sold out 2019 is complete has been sold out for for a year um, so some of the stuff is is a year or two ahead right. um, Greenland 2019 is almost sold out okay um, we're selling Japan 2020. So there, there. You've got time to think we about have, where we you want to go. About. So we keep on adding things to that. Um, we added a, this year. We added a a, a new trip. Um, we just came back from Spain, from the Spanish coast, and we did um, uh, Portugal all the way down. Um, we did not go to Madrid and do all that. We we stayed in the coast, and it, it's a spectacular coast. I mean these huge um, sea uh, stacks with arches and fantastic food. Um, and we're gonna go back there again next year. Okay. And so we try to add something new each year. We added, we did New Zealand, we did the volcanic area in New Zealand. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's nonstop. But you don't have the, you don't have the next, like, what's the next one? I, that, I know, that's not I know. Planned. That's I not know, planned yet, I mean. Um, 
Now, do, now you are partners with John Paul yeah. in the in the in the in, workshop business. In the in the in the traveling workshops, the traveling. and also we do uh, a series of creativity workshops. Okay. That we alternate between my studio and his studio. And where does he uh, live? He lives in Maine. Maine. So we do those sometimes in the summer. <laughs> Because most people don't aren't dying to go. I went to, to, Maine. I went to, to Maine. Most this people summer. aren't dying to go to Cushing, Maine, in the dead oh of winter. Oh my gosh! Um, so uh, Palm Beach Gardens, we we tend to do more in, in yeah. Florida because it's, <laughs> we have good weather. We have great weather, except for the rain on every day in the summer. But yeah. whatever, it's tolerable. Tolerable. So. Well, so all right. So do you go like say you're going to do a new location? Do you go there first and scout so it out? So that's you really, you know, technology like Technology is amazing. Um, we always hire a guide, and we always, um, a lot of times we'll go and we'll, we'll scout it out ourselves. Um, we'll we'll uh, add it to the beginning or the end of another trip. So like we were at, um, oh, okay. uh, we were in Death Valley this year and um, Arches National Park. And we took a, a little sl some side trip of 600 miles and w uh -huh. went up to scout on Volcanic Lassen Park, okay. um, which closed the day we got there because of early snow. Oh my so gosh. Um, that was a trip that basic, uh, basically being a trip to um, like Kentucky Fried Chicken for 600 miles. Oh, jeez. Um, not, not, not the ideal trip in the world. Oh. But we'll, we'll, typically we'll add on or stay longer someplace and look for another location. We'll check with guides, do a lot of research, and, and then one of the most amazing areas of research is Google Maps. Because yeah. you can now zoom, I mean, you can zoom all the way in. Because so many times I've hired guides, and they're like, oh, this is awesome. And you go, well, is it, is it a morning location or an evening location? They sort of look at you like, well, we could probably get there around 11. No, I know what time <laughs> you could get there, but like, does yeah. the sun, you know, but you go on Google lighting. Maps and you can see what the altitude is and what this, and you go, oh, the sun's going to come in right here. This is an evening location. And I mean, it, it, you can go around the entire planet and yeah. just scroll around. So like for Namibia, the, the big locations guides know about, but the, this park is a thousand square miles. Mm -hmm. There's lots of other dune fields that most of the guides that had been doing this had never heard of and show them on Google Maps like look at these dunes and different colors in the dunes and so a little logistics like getting helicopters to get us there and things like that yeah that, that takes that takes a bit of work in Africa to get helicopters for, <laughs> for but those things you, you know you, you you can work out wow yeah we use uh, and Joe likes that Sun Surveyor app are you familiar uh, yeah, with no, that? Same thing, yeah yeah, yeah. We were doing, yeah, actually we did a, because we're trying to find some new locations in the Everglades, because we do a lot of Everglades tours, obviously, we're right here, so uh, we want to find some new locations, and so we were out looking, and same thing, we do the Google Earth. And right, the Google Earth is really yeah. phenomenal, phenomenal. All right, so now, when your people, so they, they take pictures in the mornings usually, and then there are lectures, and then when do they get to process their pictures? You know, typically... We, we go out at sunrise and we go out at, at sunset. Now in Antarctica, we have 23 and a half hours of sunlight. Oh so God. that's a long sunrise and a long sunset. Um, so it, it could be any time. But typically we'll, you know, generally speaking, we'll go out very, very early before sunrise. Um, everyone finds what they want to track and what they want to photograph. Stay on location till 8.30 or 9, come back, have breakfast. Um, they work on some images. Okay. We'll start looking at images around 11 or 12. We'll start going through some other stuff and add, you know, have a lecture on storytelling or a lecture on, um, on Photoshop. And then um, we give them about five minutes of rest. <laughs> um, they eat something and then we head out around, you know, typically around four or five, depending on what time of year it is. Shoot a sunset, come back in. We'll have another night lecture, have a nightcap, have a oh, little bar really talk. Do work these people, and then we huh? start again, you know, in a few hours. So, wow. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. Wow. <laughs> it's like you better be ready to work when you go on your wor workshop. That's why yeah, you call and, it a and, workshop. <laughs> and, and most people um, end up really enjoying it. I mean, yeah. they're, they're actually well, amazed. Obviously, that, if they, they keep no, they're, coming. They're, they, you know, they go with the idea they're going on a vacation. They work their tails off. They need a vacation after yeah. they're done. But they really, they, the key is they really learn. Yeah. And, and they really advance um, their vision as a photographer and, and make a, take a, a notch up in the world of photography. So I like that. It's, um, 
Yeah, but That's, they need a vacation after they're yeah. done. Typically. Make sure you tell them, you know, take three days off after. <laughs> now, how do you organize your images? Now, you're, um, a, you're obviously a Lightroom guru. Yeah, so, so Lightroom. And um, uh, year, month, and date, I have a naming convention. So, like 2018, uh, 0823 underscore Naples would be the job name for, is it 20, no, except it's not 23rd. I don't even know what today is. Thank so you. it would be under <laughs> <laughs> what is the 2018 0824_Naples. underscore Naples. That would be my folder name. And then each image that I shot today in Naples would be, would be named the same way. So if an image ever gets out of place, I can I know what the ah, job is so I can always so it's okay. not like, you know, I you know, Nikon blah 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 or Canon this which just disappears forever. Um, everything is keyworded. Okay. Um, typically, most of my images have 50 to 75 keywords, and then I'll start making collections based on those keywords, which, you know... Can uh, you save, and this is me not being that great at Lightroom, can you save 25 to 50 keywords so that you can just say, or do you have to start typing each one in? So, um, great question. I have 8,500 keywords that I use. Yeah. Um, and the way Lightroom works is, if I were to type in your name and I have these great keywords and I photographed you six months from now, uh -huh. I type in one of those keywords and it basically says, the last time I photographed Peggy, I used these. Would you like to use these keywords? So uh -huh. the more you use keywording, the more the suggested keyword list Comes becomes up. And then you automated. Just, you just click and you can on actually them, just right? click on them and, then, and they automatically go in. It's also Lightroom handles what's called the keyword hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So if I were to keyword this location, uh -huh. we would start out and we do it from um, uh, pa uh, parent down to child. So we'd start out with continent, North America, country, United States, state, Florida, South Florida, I don't know what county we're in. Um, Cal here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> then Naples. So it would take seven, six or seven keywords just for this location. So when I say I use 50 to 60 or 75 keywords, people are like, oh my God. Yeah, because I'm I thinking put I couldn't in, think of that many. Because everything's in the hierarchy. Yeah. If I were to put in Naples, the rest of that is all automatically built in. Did you put that in ahead of time? Yeah, I built a, I, it took a lot of wine. <laughs> Good. I said, I, I, I was, oh. uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm right brain, left brain, and it's like, you know, so I just started writing keywords, and like, I started doing the animal kingdom, and well, you know, so after I got through the basic ones, I can't leave out the invertebrates, once I got to the invertebrates, I can't leave out the radically symmetrical invertebrates, because you got to have those, so then you just, and, you know, you so get you through. you built your keyword word list, but and then you add to it as you, you know, yeah. you photograph something that doesn't really fit into any of your... 8,500 keywords, most things fit in. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> but I mean, you but it did take some very good wine and a lot of it. Wow. Yeah. Because I, I sit there and I'm, I'm like, okay, what did I do today? Like, well, yesterday we went to the Everglades, although I haven't even put them on the computer yet. But uh, so I would put Everglades, Florida, Thakahatchee, because that's the part yeah, we were in. And then I started Tree. going on emotional keywords. Okay, because I would so, run so, out of so, stuff. So how does it make how does it make you feel when you see fog in the morning? So it's like peaceful, serene. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, and, and that's such a great idea. But then you're idea. looking for pictures that are serene, and all of a sudden you have all these different fog pictures come up and whatnot. So it's more than just you know, most people understand when they say keywording. Oh yeah, like location one yeah. We do that. Right. I do like light stuff, you know, like God light beams and all that. But it's also a whole level of emotional keywording. I like that. I'm and gonna, that's fun. I'm it's gonna really start intriguing. doing that because that's a great idea. Because I, you know, I like. I'm going to talk about this in my lecture tomorrow. So. Well, I'm going to be there. <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm going to. And the, the lecture, by the way, again, it's dpi-sig.org. If you're gonna, if you're in anywhere close to Cal to Naples, Florida. It'll be worth the drive. It starts, it's from 9 to 12 tomorrow. So DPI hyphen SIG. it's in the auditorium SIG. of? It's in the auditorium Florida Southwestern State College Collier County Campus. 
It's in Naples. In Naples, because, Naples not because Fort Myers. <laughs> when I just put it on my phone, that's it had name. me going to Fort Myers, and I thought, like, wow, I'm staying down here. It's 55 minutes to get up there. And so I'm very glad I actually asked, because I would have oh been there with no one in the audience, and you guys would have had no speaker. <laughs> that um, would have been. Yeah, that, that wouldn't have been so fantastic. <laughs> Boy, I do like that though. I'm gonna start using those. Emotional keywording is really that's a great and conceptual idea. keywording. What do you mean by that? Um, series of words. Um, I did an experiment. And again, this is that weird left brain, right brain thing. But um, I, I have done a lot of selling of stock images over the years. Okay. And I wanted to run an experiment on: is it the image that sells, or is it how the image is keyworded? So we were doing a workshop in Key West, and um, one of the assignments was for everyone to go out at lunch and shoot, and um, I actually went out and had a few mojitos at lunch, <laughs> and didn't have time to shoot, and our studio and you were was... in charge? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the boss makes the rules, so you know, my rule was, I'm going to go have a mojito. The mojitos were fantastic. The, they're, you know, the, the problem with having mojitos there, you can't have one in too many other places except in Cuba because, like, you know, they're done the right way. Oh, well, you know. But we come mine. back to the studio, <laughs> and I realized, like, I, I didn't shoot. And it was this, the studio was in this, um, like, two-story condo, and it had this classic um, southern Florida coloration of, like, this orange staircase with a blue rail. And I literally, and I'm not proud of this, but I literally took my camera, held it down like this, and my camera bag was at the top of the stairs, because I had already, when it I realized it didn't shoot when I came back up, held the camera and I took a picture of the staircase. It was fine for the, for the workshop, I mean, but then I decided I'm going to do a test. I'm going to emotionally keyword, the, keyword this, and I'm going to conceptually keyword okay, this. Okay, okay. So, stairway to success, stairway to the future. Uh. Ladder of success. I added 600 keywords. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, all uh, expressions. And if you're in an ad agency and you're looking for, like, you have a drug, you're looking for something on, you're not just looking for happy, you're looking for, you know, the future of success or blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. um, end of story is six figures on this image, one of my highest grossing images of all time. Because and um, the scary part is I actually wasn't looking through the camera when I took it. <laughs> and I can honestly say it's like a horrible picture. But it, it, it tied in to this concept of, of what it is that actually sells. And if you're really catering to the person on the other end, inputting the information, you can actually, and I, and I realized that, that if you now have a really good image, and it's keyworded well, bam. You're gonna make so, some money. So um, uh, wow. a, a really good example of it is Times Square is one of the most photographed places in the universe. Uh -huh. And you could probably put in the GPS coordinates down to an eighth of an inch and still come up with 14 million pictures from that, from that angle. So I went to Times Square, did the sort of classic neon pictures, but then did some research on it and Times Square wasn't always called Times Square. I didn't know that. Um, and um, so found out the name of what it used to be called, blah, 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 and I started adding that into the keywords. Well, the interesting part is anyone who does a story on Times Square does that research, so they're lo they were looking for pictures with these other names, and sure enough, out of the bazillions of pictures, it was my images that were showing up. Oh, so wow. a, lot of, a lot of work over the years on, on all this, and part of it is from licensing stock and being involved in the industry that much, but you know, the, the real idea is to make good images and <laughs> keyword, right, them, but keyword them well. But, but, it, but the keywording can really take you far, both from a commercial aspect as well as from an emotional part, to actually start building collections and working on what your vision statement is and putting a body of work together where they're tied together by keywords, you know, like eternity or you know, right, whatever the, where the good words is. Um, and it's funny, if you go to any show, People always have those names for the show. I mean, yeah. my show is called Blah, but they don't, they don't actually think of, does that word tie in to each of the images? And how much stronger would it be if rather than water, it was serenity or something, and you can actually see that in every image, and boom, it, it, t it takes it all up a level. I like that. I gotta, I've got to work on that, though. 
I'm you a, have to lay in your own couch and talk to yourself a lot. Yeah, I guess so. I don't have enough wine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and drink a lot. Yeah, no. It's, I don't like wine. I like hard liquor and beer. <laughs> hard liquor and beer. All right, well, you probably won't talk as long. <laughs> all right, so, all right. So who's interviewing who here? Huh? I know, I know. <laughs> all right, so the work that you sell to your private collectors and in the gallery shows, do you have like certain collections or do you like, are you known for, this is a Seth Resnick, he's does, like Clyde Butcher does the Everglades or whatever. Do you have, like for me, I've got my infrared collection, then I have another collection that has, like doesn't even I'm, look I'm, like it. I'm known for bold color. Bold color. Um, very strong graphics. Um, very sensual images. There's a big joke about that. that talk over wine later. Um, it's a, a G-rated show. It's a, and then <laughs> my images are G-rated. People look into them. Everybody sees what they want to see in, in, in your work. Um, but yeah, there, there is a, there is a signature that, that goes that goes with my work, and and most of it is very uh, encouraging about the environment, about saving this this planet. So that's the um, underlying. Theme. Th that's the general underlying theme. It's not to say that I don't I mean I shot my kid fishing yesterday, catching a big snook, which was awesome. But those aren't images that I'm going to. You're not going to sell a picture license. of your kid to somebody um, else. <laughs> right. No, no. But I mean, it's you know I have a I have a very tight focus on on the messages that I want to convey and the stuff that I want to sell in the gallery. And, and how do you choose those pictures out of all? They the choose me. You just say this. I, uh, this my is my the subjects one. choose me, and mm -hmm. I really feel and and you know it, it's really if you watch anyone, watch someone who who says they shoot flowers, uh -huh. and everybody can shoot a flower. But there's people that like like they connect. It's it's like wow, that guy. That's really whether it's sen you know sensuality or something else. There, those images look very different than if I was standing photographing that flower. There, there's a connection right. there. Yeah. So. The key is to really connect, and I find that my subjects find me. I'm drawn to whatever it is, and that's, that's where I dial in on, I'm photographing the energy that I feel between myself and the subject, because I really feel like, like the rock is calling my name. And it's not just that rock, or that, that rock right there is, like, is calling my name. So do um, you know when you take the picture that this yes. is it? Or do you see it later? You're no, like, I actually. Oh my God! This is um, a good picture. I, I, I very rarely. I, I will bracket to to do um, uh, to put several exposures together sometimes, but I very rarely bracket to, because I'll miss the frame with the bracket, and I never chimp. I never look at the back of the camera. I I look at the back of the camera. When I'm all done to find the image that I felt. Okay. And and I know and it's and it's always odd. You know, you shoot. 500 pictures of a rock. I mean, uh, the rock isn't moving. The light's pretty much the same. But there's one moment where something something yeah. happens that, that changes it. Um, the other thing that that and I'll talk about it tomorrow is, so many photographers photograph stages without an actor, and your image uh, needs a stage and an actor. So I don't want to make fun of any description, but I have my own little thing about. Retired males are slightly overweight and have a camera vest and carry a tripod on their back and they're technically beyond amazing and they set up for this grand vista of like Grand Canyon and they'll spend two hours setting it up waiting for the perfect light and there's nothing there. Yeah. I look at it like, okay, it is a technically masterful image. Mm -hmm. It is a stage. Where's the actor? So I want an image to have a stage and an actor. Can't and just have an actor. So when you say actor, you mean like a foreground element or something, something that draws you in. Something interest. that draws you in. Okay. Um, and, and it's something that I consciously ask myself, where, where's, where's my actor? Um, I, in I, I school, never heard it in like fact, that. In I fact, like that. I, I, I have to tell you a story. My Professor Thomas Richards at Syracuse University, who was from Kentucky, and Kentucky has a really interesting accent. I'm not gonna. You, I was gonna say, was let's like, hear. Hey, I don't you New Yorker. He was sort of like a little high pitch, and he would talk like that, and he would say, "You don't, you, you got no naked horse." And I was like, you have no naked horse. 
And to this day, there's several of us from that class, um, and we argue whether he said it was a naked woman on a white horse or whether it was a naked horse. And I think that he was thought about it and even being politically correct back in that time. It, one time, I think it was a naked woman on a horse, and that wasn't politically correct, so it became a naked horse. But the idea of a naked horse is it's just a horse. Yeah, okay. they don't wear clothes. No, <laughs> but a horse in just a field is just a horse. Correct. A horse running with water coming off the mane in early morning light mm. is a little bit different. Yeah. So there's this expression of where's the naked horse? And anyone who's taken a, a workshop of mine okay. will always, would, I mean, they would be laughing right now. I mean, someone actually, a one workshop gave me a t-shirt of the naked, ho the, oh, the naked horse. Um, but it's a question I ask. It, it's very easy to go out and photograph a stage. Yeah. And easy to go out and photograph an actor. But just like a really brilliant Broadway perf performance, there is a set. There's a main actor, there's a secondary actor. You talked about George, and when we went to um, uh, Iceland and photographed the volcano, that was a big discussion of do we get in tight with an 800 millimeter lens and just photograph the eruption? And that's neat, but everyone's seen just that. Yeah. It was much more interesting to do this sort of broad image mm -hmm. where we had clouds at night that were billowing, we had the main eruption, we had these secondary little eruptions. We had the different color of the, of the glacier. And, and the main actor was the eruption, but the eruption was 1 30th of the frame. But there were all these other actors, and together it was really a, a, a powerful image. Um, and it was, but the naked horse was, was actually the, the eruption. The eruption. That, that's good. I like that analogy. I've never heard that before, because you know, I always think, oh, you've got to find this something to, to anchor bipolar. the picture or whatever. <laughs> We were, well, last night when we were scouting, you know, we we're like, oh, look at the light, it's so pretty, look at the sunset, oh, but there's nothing really here. And, and then Joe was making fun, like, so, photographers are so picky, we've got the most glorious sunset and we're not happy because we don't have a good but, foreground but you, you, you mentioned you, sunrise and sunset. Um, you know, I live on the ocean also. It is awesome to go out and look at a sunrise and look at a sunset or look at the stars. And the reason it's awesome when you're there is because you feel it. Yeah. Photograph the same thing. I mean, just so, you know, you look at the stars and you, know, you see it every, every well, not every night, cause not, but literally, you know, I won't tell you how old I am, but for a long time <laughs> I've looked at stars. But you still, you look up and you like, and you're you, there. There's something you, you feel. Can't, yeah. Set up a tripod and take the same picture. It's not and, the same. Oh my God, it's so boring. Go to the beach. Watch, watch the sun break through the horizon line and you feel there's an energy feel. Photograph it, and it's like I have a stage with no actor. Like, yeah. there's yeah. nothing going on here. Um, so that magic of that energy is what I'm actually trying to capture. Yeah, trying that, to that. That relationship that happens with whatever the subject is, if, I, if, I, if my image can convey that, then that's a starting point of making it work. Wow. And I've had a lot of practice because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> You're not that old. You look amazing. I am that old. <laughs> <laughs> you just started young, that's all. Yeah, but I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now, so now your next trip is where? So after this... Um, or do you have a... You have a workshop here, you said, but you don't so know yeah, exactly yeah. So, when so it is. I, so, I, so I have a workshop. I, I'm moving my, my middle daughter to Seattle right after this. That's next Seattle, week. Seattle is so far yeah, away. Yeah, I know. That thing is why she's moving here. Ah! <laughs> Far away from your parents. Um, come back from that. We do a late room workshop in Florida. Uh, two or three days after the late room workshop is over, I'm off to Greenland for almost three weeks. Wow. And we're it's this is a really fantastic trip because we're instead of going all around Greenland, which I've done, um, there's a place called Scoresby Sun. Another good word for you to try yeah. to pronounce. It. We could, we could go through these foreign places and. You would You're just say that's me. I and think. You know, you know, you, although you, you could be you, wrong. You can't know. Yeah, right. I could be wrong. You I would don't never know. know. <laughs> but you can't actually go to these places and not know how to pronounce them. So there's some that are terrifying. I mean, like you have to really. Scoresby Sun is, is one of them. Scoresby Sun. Um, but Scoresby Sun is um, the area in Greenland, which everyone's studying. The end of it is the actual ice cap that's melting. Okay. It is the largest ice river or ice fjord in the world. Okay. And we're on a um, an old. 
and I mean old from, I don't know, 100 years, it's now been renovated, tri-masted, huge sailboat. We rented the whole sailboat, 18 people, 18 crew, and we're going to sail up the entire ice fjord. And I've done it on, a, I've done it on, on an icebreaker, um, which is a different experience, but on a sailboat to just spend 10 days sailing up this fjord is going to be magnificent. And it's, um, there's an area where there are these red, they're like a red sandstone and granite walls. The water's blue, and these magnificent blue icebergs come drifting by the red walls. And it's, um, in fact, I think there's a picture on the flyer for the lecture tomorrow that has these ripples in the water, and there's the red walls, and, the, and that was from Scoresby Sun. Is that on um, your website somewhere? Yeah, they're all on my... SethResnick.com. SethResnick.com. <laughs> I'm not going to say all those other ones, because if they go there, they'll find If they the go there, they'll, they'll link it. It's, it's d65.com, it's SethResnick.com, or DigitalPhotoDestinations.com. Yeah, but so Seth Resnick is sort of like an easier way to remember me. Yeah, it is. And so. you have an easy name. For you someone know? who remembers it. <laughs> well, it's not that... It's not... It's unusual enough. There are not a lot of Seths. Yeah. Um, although, on one of our trips in uh, the British Virgin Islands. We were also on a sailboat, um, and my wife's name is Jamie, and sure enough, the captain's name is Seth, and his wife, who was the chef, her name was Jamie. So here we are <gasps> on a small little sailboat That's with weird. two Seths and two Jamies. That's really so I had strange. to be Seth number one. I mean, I had, it was a, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if somebody does want to take, that you have room in the Lightroom? Workshop, you think? We have, we have, I think, two spaces in the Lightroom Workshop. And it's a four-day... It's four days. It's, it's intensive. And where do they stay? Do they just stay anywhere um, We have a ton of hotels around our recommend? home that are very inexpensive. And, you recommend? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're sleeping there. You're, you're really going to be at our house. And it's nice because you're a guest at our home, and it's, and it's, um, it's, it's great. That sounds really good. I, it sounds really, really worthwhile. I mean, just... And you will learn... Lightroom. I literally wrote, I did write, I wrote the book on Lightroom. I mean, literally. literally you um, have a book on Lightroom? I have several, but. Um, you have several books on Lightroom. Um, for well, each we version. We didn't even get into that. No, I don't, I'm not big on selling all this stuff. If you look me up, you'll see, you can see all that, all that stuff. But, How many books have you written? A few. <laughs> <laughs> Seth. Resnick.com. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. And remember, if you're in this area, anywhere near, come to the lecture tomorrow, um, August. We're going to have fun. Uh, tomorrow's August 25th, 2018. So Seth will be um, speaking. It's only $30 because it's a nonprofit and it's a membership drive for, their, for the camera club. So if you're not already a member, if you remember, it's free but it's only $30 to come. Seth's being um, sponsored by Nikon and is uh, graciously giving us his time. So I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you so much for watching the Understand Photography Show. Remember to tune in next week at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We're going to be talking about long exposures. Um, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give us a review on iTunes. The whole nine yards. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Understand Photography Show. It would help us immensely if you would click like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yeah.